Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A-Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I am going to speak to you about hormonal coordination. This is still under chapter 15 and if you're already exhausted from listening, I just charge you to go on. We are almost at the end. Um, so please just try to power through and get through the chapter. I know it is really, really, really detailed, uh, but it's a very interesting chapter. So I hope that you will be able to finish all the videos and feel prepared for when you go to class uh, with questions for your teacher or even just revising for your exams. OK, let us get into it. So when I start um, this chapter, this is a question I usually ask students, and that's the only clue that they have. So I say, why does the body use hormones? And I've put the picture of a luxury car and, um, you know, a Toyota, and I say, well, what's, what do you think? And I get very interesting responses. But the truth is that the nervous system is a fast one, but hormones are cheaper for the body to use. So in spite of having the nervous system through which we could say, well, why don't we just coordinate everything through there? The body prefers hormones in certain instances because hormones are just cheaper to use. So when we discuss hormonal coordination, we're really referring to the female reproductive system, uh, but not in as much detail as you might have had in other syllabus or syllabi of biology. Uh, in this case, we're just discussing how hormones help with the coordination of different steps. So the first step is usually ovulation. So if you are a young lady of menstruating age or even a young man in class with young ladies of menstruating age, these are the steps of ovulation. The fact that the female gamete starts to develop and then it becomes what we call a primary follicle. And that primary follicle then grows to become a secondary follicle. The secondary follicle would develop into an ovarian follicle and at ovulation, that is what is released. And this release can sometimes make ovulation painful for some women. Um, so they experience, they experience painful ovulation. Um, or after it's released, you find that many women um, tend to eat a lot more. Or they look a bit bloated. I'm going to explain that on the next slide, um, on the next few slides where I discuss the hormones. Now, once you have the ovulation and the gamete has been released, the, the tissue that's remaining, called, it forms what we call a corpus luteum. But again, I'll explain the role of that as we go along. In addition to having ovulation happening, um, you also have the uterine cycle. And the uterine cycle is something that basically prepares the uterus, or what you might call the womb, for um, an implanted egg. So it's preparing it for an implanted gamete for fertilization, or in very simple words, for a baby. Um, so in this case, you have the endometrial wall, which is lost during menstruation. So when girls undergo menstruation, they're basically losing the wall of the um, of the endometrium. It's being shed away, and that is how it comes out as blood. And after that is done, then you have the ovary and the formation of the follicle, which we had just discussed. And afterwards, the endometrial wall develops again. So it's like the body sort of lays down this layer of wall to say, well, it would be nice if you would make a baby because we are ready for a baby. Uh, but obviously, as time goes on, the endometrium becomes more developed. And if there is no baby, there's no fertilization, then it would degenerate and be shed um, as blood in menstruation again. So this is just um, giving you like information on things like the uterine cycle and the ovulation cycle as well. Now, let's now look at what is I, what I consider to be the fun part. So the menstrual cycle is a 28-day cycle for most people. Um, some people have 30 to 35 days. It all depends on how the body functions. But 28 days is considered uh, the normal um, cycle for most women. And in this cycle, most women undergo a lot of hormonal changes. Um, so you can see from the first day of the cycle, um, usually up until the fifth day, for some women it goes up to seven days, you have menstruation. And so in this case, um, women are like losing the endometrial wall and it's shedding out as blood and coming out of their body. Um, you also then have the ovulation and you have the thickening of the uterine wall. So this is not about when to conceive. That's not what I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to teach you how the hormones coordinate all these different stages in the body. So yeah, let's look at it. This is my favorite graph. There are four hormones that you have to know for this. And this um, question I found in quite a number of CIE exams. You have to know the luteinizing hormone. That's called LH. I'm just going to spell luteinizing here very quickly. 
um, it's written like that, the luteinizing, sometimes it's a Z or an S, it depends, um, the luteinizing hormone. You have the follicle stimulating hormone, you have estrogen and you have progesterone. Now let's look at the colors like what is happening with all of these hormones at different days of the menstrual cycle. So remember we said day one of the cycle is the first day of a woman's period. So this is usually the first day. And you would see that while the period is happening over there, we, let's assume that the period stops at day five. Um, the luteinizing hormone is quite low. Uh, the um, What's it called? The, that's the luteinizing hormone. The follicle stimulating hormone, which is this green one over here, is also low. Um, you have a little spike in estrogen, but nothing too hectic to worry about. Um, so those hormones, all the hormones are not really that high. But what you'll notice also here is that there is something called the follicle development. So you have the primary follicle and it continues to grow until it forms the secondary um, follicle over there. All right. And that just continue, um, continues to grow. And you will notice that as we go through the cycle, estrogen starts to increase very slowly. All right. So we have an increase in estrogen that occurs quite slowly. And you can see it starts to occur there from about day 10 or day 11 thereabout. I'm just going to erase that so that it doesn't confuse you. And as estrogen is increasing, what you will also see is that the follicle is developing. Can you see that? Now, once you get to the ovulatory phase, which is usually sort of halfway through the cycle or almost halfway through the cycle, you find that there's a spike in estrogen or estrogen increases to about four times what it was before. That increase in estrogen stimulates the increase of the luteinizing hormone, which is this one, as well as the follicle stimulating hormone. Now, this primary follicle that is developing here, becoming the secondary follicle and growing, once this spike happens for these two hormones, that's for luteinizing and for FSH, the um, structure, the follicle will then release the gamete, okay, or you can call it the egg for easy um, understanding. Well, you can't call it that in the exam, but for this explanation, um, you can say it releases the gamete. Once the gamete is released, the follicle structure then becomes what is called the corpus luteum, which we just saw on the previous slide. So corpus luteum over there. And the corpus luteum is also a hormone secreting um, organelle in itself. So now let's look at this. Then we have the spike and once ovulation happens, the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone become very low again and they stay low as you can see for the most part. What you then start to notice is that there is an increase in progesterone. Now remember at the beginning of the cycle we did not see progesterone happening at all like it was flat zero but once ovulation happens progesterone starts to increase. That is because progesterone is secreted by the corpus luteum. And what progesterone does is that it maintains the wall of the endometrium. It maintains the wall of the uterus so that um, the, if there's fertilization, there would be room for the fertilized egg to nest and to be able to grow. That is the role of uh, progesterone. So it thickens the wall of the endometrium. So you see that there's an increase in progesterone. But as we go along, we start to see that there is no fertilization happening. And so the corpus luteum starts to degenerate. And as it starts to degenerate, you also see that there is a decrease in the amount of progesterone that is produced, which means that as we decrease the amount of progesterone that is produced, that then results in the endometrial wall being unstable and it comes out as menstruation. So that is the cycle in a nutshell. You also have a little spike in estrogen. The big question students are usually asked is, how do you know, for example, they give a graph like this and they say, how do you know that this woman did not get pregnant. And what you can simply say is she didn't get pregnant because the uh, progesterone levels decreased back to zero or they decreased. You can just say decreased because if the woman gets pregnant, the progesterone levels will stay high because the wall of the endometrium has to be um, maintained. But if progesterone starts to decrease, that just tells you that there was no fertilization and so there's no need for the wall of the endometrium to be maintained. And as a result of that, most of the endometrial tissue or all of the endometrial tissue rather will come out as blood until the next month when the process repeats itself again. So this is this graph in a nutshell and that is how hormones coordinate um, the menstrual cycle. If you found it confusing, just put questions in the chat or if you have a question from a past paper,
you can also post it in the chat, um, in the comment section rather, and just have students, your colleagues or myself respond to you so that you can clarify your understanding. Um, and so from here, we go on to how we prevent uh, pregnancy. And these are all the different birth control methods like condoms, female condoms, the pill, the hormonal ring, all of these. Um, the pill is very common um, in most countries used to prevent pregnancy. For some people, they might have very severe side effects. So it's always good to speak to your gynecologist about your options before you decide to go on the pill. The pills are synthetic hormones and these hormones most of the time are progesterone hormones. So when a woman takes the pill, what she's actually telling her body is that she's already secreting progesterone. So she's fooling the body to think that ovulation has already happened. And so as a result of that, ovulation naturally would not happen because she's fooling the body, which means that the body will think, okay, well, you know, things are going all in dandy. And so she takes progesterone and some of them also contain estrogen. Um, synthetic hormones, like I said, they are not easily broken down by the body in some cases and can act for longer than you need them to. So you can actually go on platforms and you'd read the stories of some women who have been on birth control and sort of read their experiences if you are considering taking birth control. So in this case, you have estrogen and progesterone in a pill, um, and what they do is they prevent the secretion of FSH and LH, so the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. Once these hormones are suppressed, ovulation would not happen, just like I said, okay? Ovulation would not happen, and as a result of that, the body is fooled into thinking it has happened uh, because progesterone is so high. Women usually take that pill for 21 days, and then they take a placebo for seven days during which they're supposed to menstruate. Um, so, and that way, um, they're basically fooling the body into a new kind of cycle. The hormones can be like a patch or an injection, uh, progesterone only pills also prevent ovulation so not only the combination pill and in some cases they make the cervix mucus so they make the mucus of the cervix really thick such that per, um, sperm is unable to penetrate that mucus and as a result of that they're able to prevent pregnancy you also have what we call the morning after pills morning after pills are taken after a sexual act is occurred without protection and as a result of that, people will take a morning after pill in order to stop the sperm from reaching the egg and fertilizing it. So they used to stop pregnancy. So this is typically what you need to know about hormonal coordination. I, however, feel the need to tell you that most of the questions would ask or most of the questions I've seen would say, outline how a progesterone only pill prevents pregnancy. And it's often for about four marks. So first things first, you have to say that it suppresses the release of follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. The suppression of these would mean that ovulation does not occur. It also ensures that the cervix mucus is thick. It prevents the um, sperm from reaching the, the egg or reaching the gamete, the female gamete. Um, these are all things that will get you four marks in full. Um, so make sure to just take note of that. Um, and it also fools the body um, into a new kind of cycle and can prevent um, the release of a female gamete. So just putting that in um, would help you with this question. So this is it on hormonal coordination. Again, nice, short and sweet, I hope. If you have any questions, post them in the comments and we will get back to you as soon as possible. We being either me, the teacher, or your fellow students who are learning on the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good time. Goodbye.